the entertainment and sports arena, the home of the Carolina Hurricanes. And who would have dreamt that nearly five years to the day after ground was broken on this facility, that it would be center stage to the NHL's greatest event and the home to its loudest fans. Hi everybody, I'm John Forslund, TV voice of the Carolina Hurricanes, and the video you're about to see is a commemorative piece that takes us all the way back to the start of this incredible journey. One that starts in preseason, extends on through the Olympics, and through those great playoffs. It's the story of a bond, a bond between the players and their fans. It's a look back at the 2001-2002 Carolina Hurricanes. At the conclusion of the 2000-2001 playoffs, a gritty 4-2 series loss to the defending Stanley Cup champion New Jersey Devils. It was apparent that the Hurricanes were on the cusp of becoming a legitimate force in the NHL. Their fans had discovered the intensity of playoff hockey and had grown to love the team. However, the Hurricanes front office knew that there were some holes that needed to be addressed. At the start of last year, we had to strengthen a couple of areas and we we strengthened that with Brasso and goal. We had more depth at that point, and also with Aaron Ward, big physical defenseman. And uh, for the start of the season, we liked our team. With the roster set, the Hurricanes were ready to begin summer workouts for the season to come. The season began with a bang as Sandus Oselinch put the Canes on top 28 seconds into the game on an assist from rookie Eric Cole on his first shift in the NHL. I had, you know, all my family and friends come in for the game and, uh, you know, it's Rangers so it's MSG so everyone was watching back in New York and uh, really it was just, it was just luck. Um, you know, I just uh, didn't really have an option to pass it to Marty and so I just teed her up and, uh, you know, fortunately enough, uh, Sandus was coming in and he, he, you know, poked in the rebound. Two minutes later, Darren Langdon would put the game winner in and the Canes were off and running. At the end of October, the Hurricanes were atop the Southeast Division, a lead they would never relinquish during the season. In November, the number one line of Ron Francis, Jeff O'Neill, and Sammy Kapanen blossomed into one of the most feared lines in the NHL. At this point of the season, Eric Cole began feeling the strain of NHL life and the pressure of remaining an everyday player. You know, Colesy was a big surprise. I mean, nobody was counting on this kid coming out of training camp, and he stepped in and played great for us, and, and uh, not only adds a lot of grit in that position, but also a lot of finesse in the way he handles the puck and drives to the net. And, creates a lot of open ice out there. Each day and, and each game I, I needed to go out and, and prove myself and uh, you know, just keep proving to myself and to the coaching staff and management that I belonged here. Bates Battaglia came into his own en route to a personal milestone, 20 goal season. It was a pretty big deal for me. Uh, you know, I, I hadn't had the, uh, the best year of the year before so uh, coming in I wanted to play well and uh, um, personally, I think that uh, when you can go out and, and do that, um, you know, it, it's, it's good for your confidence. It definitely gives me some confidence coming into this season. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of a, a, you know, a marker, you know, a goal that, uh, you know, you've always wanted to reach, and, and uh, I got it. The duel to be the number one goaltender began to be defined. So goalies are uh, athletes with a pretty, pretty selfish uh, mindset because there's room only for one of us in the net, and uh, we want to take it all. The arduous schedule began to steal the hurricane spirit for the remainder of the season. From the start of the season last year, it was difficult. From the 21st of October till Thanksgiving Day, and we played a quarter of our schedule, and, and uh, I, I was very worried. We were still getting points, unfortunately, all the ties, but we were still getting points in that stretch. Mostly because we were playing very good positional hockey. I don't think that we had great jump. I don't think we were real sharp, but we were tired. There's no question. But we survived it. Other teams didn't. A few weeks after his 500th career game as an NHL coach, Paul Maurice and the Hurricanes were hit with a four-game losing streak. Something needed to change. On December the 5th, Jim Rutherford traded defenseman Steve Halko and a fourth-round pick to the St. Louis Blues for former fan favorite, the hard-nosed Sean Hill. Well, Sean Hill's always been a great fit here. You know, he's a good player. Uh, very determined player, 
uh, with a lot of character. I mean, we just lost four in a row, so nobody was in a good mood. And and he walks in with a big smile on his face after the trade. Hey, everything's great, guys. What's the problem? Uh, and it was infectious. Three days after uh, some more difficult skates than we normally have during the season, uh, everybody was in a good mood again. And, and having a guy come in in a good mood and, and uh, not having to go through some of the dog days that we went through in that stretch, he, it was a real boost for us. You know, they asked me if I wanted to, to get the first flight in the morning. And I said, is there anything earlier? And uh, you know, I ended up taking the red eye at like 12.30 at night and, uh, you know, got in here at 6 in the morning or whatever. But, uh, you know, I couldn't get here soon enough. With Sean Hill back on the blue line, the Hurricanes rattled off three straight victories and finished off December with an 8-3-1 and record, including a 7-0 drubbing of the Pittsburgh Penguins. It was also the birth of the BBC line of Rod Brindamore, Bates Battaglia, and Eric Cole. I enjoy being with those guys. Uh, you know, Eric and I really uh, connect a little bit more. I think we're, you know, he's younger, but he's got kids, and, and I think uh, we connect a little more. Bates is still on his own. He still does his wild thing, and, you know, we'll let him do that. And, and, uh, but again, it's just fun because they bring a lot of energy, and, uh, and every shift is the same. On December the 28th, the BBC line recorded two milestones in one night. For Bates Battaglia, it was notching his 100th career NHL point. For center Rod Brindamore, it was racking up point number 800 in the NHL. I think it's a nice number just to kind of pass. And, you know, I mean, there's obviously there's a couple of more numbers you'd like to get to before that, that number starts sinking in. And I think, uh, again, Ronnie puts everything in perspective. I mean, what he's done uh, and what he continues to do uh, kind of puts anyone's numbers to shame. January is typically the month of fresh starts and new beginnings. But for the Hurricanes, it started with three straight losses. A grinding schedule and a penchant for playing close games was taking its toll on the Canes, who at one point sent an NHL record for consecutive ties with eight. You know, you want to win those games for your fans and you go to seven straight ties at home, you've just about seen enough of them. But we were playing very, very well in that stretch. And that's the part that I was encouraged by. So by the middle of the month, it was decided that the team needed a fresh look. So GM Jim Rutherford traded all-star defenseman Sandus Ozelinch and Byron Ritchie to the Florida Panthers for Brett Hedekin and Kevin Adams. That was a deal that, uh, from a team point of view, had to be done. It was almost uh, uh, addition by subtraction. I really think that addition, adding another experienced NHL veteran, made a huge difference to us. January also marked the etching of Ron Francis's name into the history books of the National Hockey League. On January the 2nd, in his 1,000th game with the Hurricanes franchise, Ron Francis scored his 500th goal, marking his entry into the elite class of only five other players to score 500 goals and have over 1,000 assists. I think anytime you get the 499, you want it to happen in a hurry. Um, you know, it was it was great. Uh, my dad had flown in that day, and uh, it happened that night. Um, we had to change his flight to get him home earlier, but no, it was you know it was great to be able to do it while he was there, and, and uh, you know at home in front of your hometown fans. And uh, you know it's been a long time coming, but uh, certainly it's nice to get it accomplished. Then on January 26th versus the Philadelphia Flyers, Ron moved past Raymond Bork on the all-time NHL assist list, second only to the great one, Wayne Gretzky. should get an assist, and that'll be 1170, and you can move over Raymond Bork, because Ron Francis, with that assist, will be number two on the NHL's all-time assist list. What a moment. I pride myself on being more of a playmaker than a goal scorer, so uh, that milestone is obviously extremely special for me. And you know, it was just a, a game in Philadelphia. It was kind of late. The puck was behind the net, and, and I fired it out to O, and, and he made a great shot upstairs. Uh, um, you know, I, I very proud to hit that milestone. Also, very proud to, to have him score the goal that, that accomplished it, because. Obviously, uh, you know, he's meant a lot to my career here the last uh, four years I've been in Raleigh and, and hopefully I've you know, helped him a little bit in his, so it was, it was great that uh, you know, we could connect on that one uh, together, which was fun. A living legend and certain Hall of Famer, we here in the Carolinas are honored to have witnessed this man play. In this year's postseason, Ron was awarded the Lady Bing and the Clancy Trophy for gentlemanly play and off-ice charitable contributions. 
Well, I don't think anybody should be surprised by what Ron Francis does. Uh, the only surprise that I have about Ron Francis is he doesn't get the recognition that he should in the hockey world. Uh, you know, I'm still like a kid in the candy store when I come to the rink playing with Ronnie. He, uh, you know, I can remember growing up watching him play and, you know, I still, used to, I still bug him that I used to buy his hockey sticks when I was in, uh, in Pee Wee. And uh, it's just a true honor. I mean, it, it, it's almost like it's, it's such a, a repetitious thing that he does all these accomplishments. You almost take them for granted a little bit, and you just, you're just so used to him every game or every week doing something that uh, you almost don't show enough appreciation. But uh, it's definitely an honor for me to play alongside him, and hopefully I can uh, get a couple more years out of him. He's an unbelievable player and a classy guy, and uh, you know he's someone that uh, you know not guys guys don't come along like that very often. And uh, to to be a, a teammate of his and uh, play on the, the same uh, team as him is uh, you know something uh, you'll remember forever. On January 29th, we took a moment to honor our captain, Ron Francis. And welcome to a very special night in Carolina, and a very special night in the history of the Carolina Hurricanes. You know, every so often in the game of hockey, there comes a very special player. A player who epitomizes the ideal of true sportsmanship. A player who not only combines great talent on the ice, but exhibits class and dignity away from the game. We have that very player here in Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain, Ron Francis. This time, Mr. Carmanis and Mr. Rutherford would like to present to Ron a special gift a handcrafted cherry trophy case with three Tiffany crystal pieces and one silver plate for every milestone Ron has achieved this season. One to commemorate 1,500 NHL games played. One to recognize 1,000 games with this organization achieved on January 2nd. One for recording 500 National Hockey League goals that very same night. And one for moving into second place all time, NHL assists, surpassing Raymond Mort this past Saturday night in Philadelphia. This has truly been a milestone season. Let's hear it for our captain number 10, Ron. It was a special night for a lot of reasons. One, I, you know, I think uh, it was great the organization to do it. I felt uh, honored that they felt, um, uh, you know, well enough of me to, to have a night like that. And, and I thought the way they handled it was was first class. So it was really enjoyable for me in that aspect, and um, very special for me. To, you know, anytime I think your family gets down and on the ice. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, Mary Lou does a lot of that behind the scenes work, especially when we're on the road and traveling with, with the three kids. But to see the four of them on the ice and, and uh, the smiles on them, and especially, you know, the kids, uh, you know, uh, their eyes wide open and being a part of that was a lot of fun. And, you know, it gave me an opportunity to, you know, bring my mom and dad and brother down. And, and uh, you know, I had a great surprise in, in my good friend Al Samuelson coming out on the ice and uh, a lot of other good friends that have flown in for that night, uh, which was great. So, um, you know, it's uh, obviously a very special night, one I enjoyed very much. His uh, true greatness will not be uh, seen in the stats. I mean, everybody will appreciate what he's done because he will have such great numbers, but really his ability to play and his ability to lead is not uh, best seen in the numbers in the book, but more in the day-to-day -day effect that he's had on all of us. Uh, when he ultimately decides to retire, uh, he will end uh, his career as one of the greatest players to ever play the game. With February came the All-Star break, and once again, the fabulous Finn, Sammy Kapanen, was chosen amongst the league elite to represent the Canes at the All-Star Classic. 
And again, Sammy proved to the world that he was indeed the fastest man on skates. Sammy Kapanen has won this event. He's tied for 12th in league scoring. He was the 2000 winner at 13.649. And he is motoring. One last turn. This will be the fastest time, I think, 14.039. I've always loved to watch Sammy Kapanen skate. That is one of the, the great joys of practicing every day, a standing still at the red line. And, and watching him drill and watching him take off because it really uh, reminds you how far you are from ever playing in the NHL when you see a guy like that, that pure skill. He represents the Hurricanes well when he plays for the Hurricanes and in this case going to the All-Star game and going to the Olympics uh, was just another step that, that uh, is a credit to him and, and also a credit to the Hurricanes. It, it was a uh good experience for myself and uh, had a good time. It was kind of boost for the rest of the season. Under it now. Empty net. Shot in. Deflected by Sammy Kapanen. And this All-Star game has been decided. By mid-February, the Hurricanes needed a break to recover from that grueling first-half schedule that saw them play more games than any other team in the NHL. And that break came in the form of the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake, as the NHL stopped play and allowed their greatest players to represent their respective countries. The Hurricanes had three representatives from their squad in the Olympics, goalkeeper Arthur Zerbe of Latvia, Sammy Kapanen of Finland, and Tom Barrasso of the United States. Tom was fortunate enough to bring home a silver medal as the first place Canes were set to enter the stretch run. The Canes would come out of the blocks after the Olympic break refreshed and focused and ready to go on quite a run to finish the year. Arthur Zerbe would record his 200th career win and surpass Mike Liut as the franchise's most winningest goaltender. He would also assert himself as the number one guy, a move that was solidified on March 5th when GM Jim Rutherford traded wingers Chris Dingman and Shane Willis for a young goaltender a man named Kevin Weeks. Um, that trade was made because we needed a goalie in their 20s with NHL experience that could play alongside Arthur Zerbe and ultimately uh, be the number one goalie for the Hurricanes. As the trading deadline approached, another shrewd move was pulled off by Jim Rutherford. Instead of opting for a veteran player on the market, Jim made the call to Lowell and made the decision to bring up Yaro Swoboda. Uh, we really believed in uh, Swoboda, um, the fact that he had great hockey sense and he could come into that line and hold his own. As we found out as time went along, we, we were right. After sending Tom Barrasso to Toronto, the Canes lineup was set for the playoff push. Hockey is a goal sport, both on the ice and in the locker room. The coaching staff and the front office spend the season trying to fulfill these goals. The first goal you focus on is the division title. And on April 10th, Jeff O'Neill and the Hurricanes accomplished that first goal. The Southeast Division is getting better and better. Good young players. Um, I think uh, in the future you're going to see real tight races. But the fact that we won our division last year is a real credit to our players and our coaches. We achieved the goal that we were supposed to based on where we were at in January, and it was a good feeling. With the division locked up, the third-seeded Carolina Hurricanes set their sights on their next goal the Stanley Cup Playoffs. Their opponent, the defending Eastern Conference champion, New Jersey Devils. Would the Canes be ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the team that had knocked them out the previous season? Well, I think Brad Hedekin said it best. He said, you know, this New Jersey team, it's, you know, they've been up there a long time. It's, time. it's time for some new blood. The competition in game one was everything hockey should be as Warriors collided, and the BBC led the way. And the Devils are blocking out, and a nice save. Tanabe gets another chance, they score! Game two, Eric Cole gave the Canes a fleeting lead as Bobby Holik tied the game at one. Arthur Zerbe and Martin Brodeur slammed the doors shut, and sudden death overtime came to Carolina, 
a recurring theme that would be played out eight more times. It's hard to contain your emotions, and uh, it was just, uh, you know, uh, anytime you walk away like that, it's, it's, it's a nice feeling. When the series went to the Meadowlands, it was familiar territory to the Devils. Though their backs were against the wall, they played like the defending Eastern Conference champions and took both games from the Canes and tied the series at two to send it back to Raleigh. That's when Paul Maurice would make his most significant decision of this series. I didn't take Arthur Serbe out of the net because I didn't like his game. He just got some bad breaks. His confidence was still intact in my mind. So we made the decision to come back with Kevin after the first period in game four. And, and I think at that point you know that one of two things is going to happen. If Kevin goes in and plays as solidly as he did, then you're going to have to come back with him in game five, win or lose. And in game five, Shady 80 made his first playoff start ever. A move that would prove to be the difference in Game 5 as Kevin Weeks was a dominating force between the pipes. Down by one in the third with little over a minute left to go. Jeff O'Neill found a loose puck in a bevy of humanity. Francis pulls it out for Nabor Rock, centers one on goal. Loose puck, they score! They score! It wasn't exactly on my uh, my pretty goal list, but it was a power play goal, and, and um, you know, Rod Roddy Brindamore tried to pass it in front and got held up in Brodeur's pad, and you know, if it was in their building, they might have got an earlier whistle, but. Uh, you know, it just kind of sat there and I, I just dug it in the net and, you know, it eventually turned out to be a big goal because if we had lost that game, it would have been a different series. With the score nodded at two, the Canes would play in their second overtime game at the ESA, where the fans began proving their mettle as the loudest fans in the NHL. Oh, it was never more evident than when Kevin Weeks made the save of the playoffs. It's game five. It's a very decisive game in a, in a playoff series. and. And uh, he makes the save that uh, everybody dreams of when, when you are a little kid. You, you dream of uh, making that save in overtime. I can remember seeing all that net. And I can remember seeing Madden stepping into the puck and then stepping down from the bench and, and almost turning to go because there was no way he could stop that puck. And then waiting for the waiting for that sound, there's this particular sound when he gets scored on, this, there's a, this deadly silence before the, the sadness of the crowd that never came and then that cheer and thinking, you know, my God, how did he stop that puck? And then even still I look at it, and there's no way he should have had that, but he did. Kowalski gets it once again, inside it goes, a man free in front, Riche, what a stop, the rebound, what a save again, Kevin Weeks! Inside it goes, a man free in front, Riche, what a stop! The rebound, what a save again, Kevin Weeks! Inside it goes, a man free in front, Riche, what a stop! The rebound, what a save again, Kevin Weeks! Uh, he was able to, to help the team with that one save and I think also pushed the team a little bit farther, gave them uh, some confidence and also the maybe sense of destiny. On this night, destiny was on the stick of the Czech condor, Josef Wasacek. Corner, dug out by Wasacek. Now shell on the walk, centers one, Svoboda! Wasacek, scores! Hey, hey, what do you say? Josef Wasacek, and the Canes win game five! The puck just was lying between the, uh, like right in the middle. And uh, nobody, nobody was around me, so I just, you know, I'll, I'll grab it and I was just close my eyes and shoot as hard as I could. You know, the guys showed that we were ready to play and we weren't going to be bowled over like we uh, we had been in the past. And uh, you know, if they were going to beat us, they're going to have to beat us, uh, you know, right into oblivion. If they're going to do it, because we're going to be coming back every every step of the way. Defining moments. In every player's career, there comes a time where that player needs to stand out. For Kevin Weeks, it was in Game 5. And for Ron Francis, he has done this many times in his great career. So it was fitting in Game 6 
that the definitive moment for this franchise in North Carolina would come off the stick blade of number 10, like he has done so many times in the past. team that was as good as Jersey was, a lot of people had, had picked to go to the Stanley Cup Finals, uh, be able to beat them uh, in that series and, and especially the way that we did on the road in their building to close it out was, uh, you know, that was a huge boost for our confidence and I think uh, a huge eye opener for a lot of people that, you know, hey, maybe this team is for real. The Hurricanes had defeated the Devils and were moving on to the second round for only the second time in franchise history. We beat a good hockey club, a team that everyone had picked to, to go a long ways, and a team that had won Stanley Cups in the recent past, so I think that was huge. From a general manager's point of view, working off of that plan, uh, building a team that we thought was the best team in the Eastern Conference to beat, and then ultimately getting to that game and beating them, that was a pretty damn good feeling. Elsewhere in the East, the upstart Montreal Canadiens were riding emotion into the second round after knocking off the number one seeded Boston Bruins. Combined with the Flyers losing to Ottawa in the first round, suddenly the Canes had home ice advantage all the way through to the Stanley Cup Finals. But first, they had to deal with the Cinderella Montreal Canadiens. With a miraculous recovery from abdominal cancer and a return to playing hockey, Montreal's Saku Koivu was the story of the year in the NHL. Uh, what a remarkable individual and determined and, uh, and a great player. And he came back and in short order contributed to that team. Combined with the backstopping of Hart Trophy candidate Jose Theodore, the Canadians were anything but a pushover. In the end, it was the Canes who wrestled victory away in Game 1. And Kevin Weeks was 3-0 and in his three first playoff starts ever with two shutouts. And Cole comes back the other way. Look at the speed. Eric Cole comes in. Theodore with a save. Battaglia tried to get it back out in front. Battaglia for Cole! Score! Eric Cole gets the reward! After we had scored the goal, after Bates made the pass to me, uh, he and Gilmore collided, and uh, Gilmore turned and you know, kind of threw a jab at Batesy, and so I basically just stood in the way of, of him to, to Bates. And I mean, obviously, I think it looked you know a little bit worse than what I intended, but then again, you know, I, I'm if you if our team scores a goal, you know, what, what are they going to do about it? Everything was going according to plan until Jose Theodore and Saku Koivu combined to take game two from the Hurricanes as the home crowd saw their first playoff loss at the ESA. I still think maybe the best game that we played in the playoffs is game two that we lose 4-1 at home and it should have been 46-16 and we just dominate them and, and Theodore again is, is phenomenal and there's that fear. He's not just good at this point. It's a little unnerving. In game three, the Hurricanes again tried to forcefully knock through the Theodore wall, but were denied time and time again. And just as all seemed lost, Bates Battaglia broke a hole in the wall, and we were headed to overtime once again. Lose a tough one in overtime in a game that was pretty even, but I thought for the first game on the road in, in Montreal that we were that we had played well and now you're a little concerned. But I still think we can win it. Even if we had gone down 3-1 in that series, I still thought that we would win it. In game four, going into the third period, the Canes were down 3-0. Jose Theodore seemed to be the immovable object as the Canes pelted away at him only to come up short over and over. However, this game would be different as the Canes displayed a trait we have witnessed all season, an undying will and an ability to never give up. A lot of guys uh, stepped up and said, you know, we're, we're not out of this and, and I think a lot of people counted us out and uh, I think that uh, the, uh, the teammates that we had that the older guys, they, uh, they definitely got us uh, picked up and, and ready to come out for the third that game. And I really felt, even going into that third period when we were down, even had we lost that game, we were still going to win because we were by far the better team in that series. That was not even a question. I mean, we're bombing them, out shooting them, getting great sc scoring chances, and, you know, Theodore is standing on his head, and I think uh, it was just a matter of time. We've thrown everything we, you know, we've had, but there's got to be something else we can throw at them. Let's keep going. Somehow we'll find a way to crack this. And, 
you know, I think the turning point was getting that, that first goal and, and that just seemed to put a little crack in the dam and, and all of a sudden the water started coming through. And that was a great pass right in the wheelhouse and, uh, you know, when you get a pass like that, basically all you got to do is swing hard and in case you make contact and, uh, you know, get a shot on that because you know the guys are going to be there in front if there's a rebound and, uh, you know, that got us started and then, uh, you know, it just snowballed from there. Finally beat Theodore. It was just building off of you know shift after shift, and, and every line that was out there, you know, they were working hard. And you're thinking, you know what? If we keep this up, you know, they, we we can make something out of this. When Bates scored to make that game three two. You could sense it again on the bench, and the guys are they're starting to feel real good about themselves. And it's almost like they know an inside joke that nobody else knows. You know, they're starting to kind of they're moving different on the bench, and they're starting to get excited. And now the now the walks, holds, shoots one, he scores. Short side on Theodore. Bates Pataglia has brought the Carolina Hurricanes within one. You know, when Eric ties that game, it's almost like you shouldn't be surprised. Everybody's saying, yeah, that's what we thought was going to happen. I was just standing in front and, uh, there was uh, one of the defense was was near me. I, he, yeah, I remember getting hit by him, and then I just kind of drifted off to the back door while the puck went across. And uh, I think Batesy got a tip on it. It was just a big scramble in front. And when I saw the rebound, I know that the, that uh, Theodore didn't see it, and so I uh, you know, tried to get a handle on it, and uh, I actually almost lost it for a split second and got it right back. And you know, before he even recognized that I had you know possession of the puck, it was pretty much in. You know, everybody went out pulling on the same rope, and uh, you know nobody was uh, nobody was getting on getting on anybody else's case. You know, they all just you know we were a team, and, and, and that was probably as, as good a team effort as we've had. Nick Willian, the perfect guy to score that goal. You know, throw it at the net. And Jeff O'Neill, who had struggled a little bit in the first two rounds, wins a key face-off, playing on the line with Vasilevic, and and Nick Willian scores that goal. Yeah, I got the puck, and I did. I was just trying not to hit anybody. Well, I'm not a big goal scorer, so I mean that, that was just amazing to to be the one to score the goal. And I thought, I thought the whole game, I, I thought it was like the, the turning point in this area. Oh, it was. And the Canes never looked back. They had broke through the Theodore wall, and now they were set to punch holes in at will. And the Raleigh Moms were treated to a 5-1 victory on Mother's Day. You know, we had a little momentum going into that, and, and uh, I think that uh, you know we came out and got that first goal, and I think that that, that really uh, you know put put a nail in a coffin. And uh, I think that they you know they thought, oh no, it's going to be one of those nights, and, and it, it turned out to be one of them. Dead, and he is hit hard by O'Neill, picked up by Jemela. He scores. Jelena, three minutes and 17 seconds in. Cole, into the Montreal line, it's picked up here. Brindamore on the 10th, it's good! Brindamore makes it 2 on the Carolina. Good on, every pass, Francis, quick redirect, it's good! Power play goal, 3 on the Carolina. This line doing a good job, and they score! Westland has scored! Cole sets it up, Mepitaglia scores! They keep on rolling! 5-1! Hennepin shot to flex wide, the Taglia behind the goal, Jindamore out, the BBC is down, the shot, they score! Sets up Kevin F. 
Adams over the line, coming up on the event, walking in, he scores! Kevin Adams! A sub-watch attack, and the Kings have a 4-0 lead! The hit by Jeff O'Neill, shoots one, he scores! Takes it off, and Real claps him in the box. O'Neill, the traffic and punch, and up, down the box. O'Neill shot, he saved it, he scores! Second of the game, another power play goal, Carolina. Three for three on the power play, and they lead it. And the Carolina Hurricanes' mission to win the Stanley Cup will continue. So the Canes were in the Eastern Conference Finals for the right to play for the Stanley Cup. They had just defeated the NHL's most storied franchise, the Montreal Canadiens. Next up, Canada's pride the Toronto Maple Leafs. The Canes once again were severe underdogs with heavy obstacles like the red-hot goaltending of Curtis Joseph, the fact the Leafs were getting Matt Sundin and Darcy Tucker back from injury, and the red-hot performance of former Kane Gary Roberts. So once again, the Leafs were supposedly the NHL's team of destiny. I was a little more nervous than that one because uh, I was born and raised in Toronto. I played for Toronto uh, briefly, but more so for my parents. They have to live in Toronto. Uh, uh, everybody there, they're diehard Leaf fans, and uh, my parents were just scared to death that the Leafs were going to win, and they'd have to listen to these people for the for uh, the whole summer and years to come. So <clears throat> I was nervous for them, but I felt pretty good about the series. It was said in the previous series that the fans in Montreal were wild and they had the loudest in the NHL. But that was about to change. Right from the beginning of Game 1 of the Eastern Conference Championship, a new king was ordained. The loudest fans in the league were right here in the triangle. The ESA had become Hockey Town South and the noise in this place was deafening. I, I, it's, I know it's been beat on a lot about how great of fans we have now, um, but I, there's something more to it. They're not just loud, they're not just crazy, they really believe in our club and they want us to win and they're behind us so much more than anywhere I've been before and it's a different feeling. I mean, I know in the area here what's great about it is, you know, what I've seen you have state fans and Carolina fans and Duke fans and they kind of all go at each other, but we're, you know, we're Raleigh's fans I mean, we're their team and I think uh, they all pull for us and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a great Great atmosphere. It's not a big city, but we're all kind of in it together. I've played in a lot of buildings, a lot of loud buildings, but I've never played in one where you had to actually scream at your teammate if he was 12 inches away from you just so he could hear you. Compared to other buildings, this is number one. If you go to different places, they're not saying, hey, you got a great team. They're saying, my God, your fans are incredible. And running into people in Toronto and different cities who actually came down from the game to just rave the boat. Not how much, just how, how, you know, how nice a building it was and how loud it was, but how great the fans were. How, how well they were treated, uh, how much fun they had. It was a coming out party for everybody, the hockey players, but more so the fans. To see where we are now with our building sold out and, uh, you know, by far the best fans in the league. With the sound levels surpassing 120 decibels, the Eastern Conference Finals began in Raleigh. Hurricanes took the lead on a deflection by Jeff O'Neill, but would wind up losing game one on a tip shot by Jonas Hoagland. In game two, the Toronto faithful were predicting a sweep, and the Maple Leaf players gave little respect to their southern opponent. You know, for them to have a lack of respect for us is that's fine with us, you know, because we know we're going to show up every game and we're going to play hard every game, and if we do, uh, you know, we didn't get all the way to the, the conference finals by an accident. I think the teams we played didn't respect us, and that's... Toronto is a perfect example of that. I, I think they thought they were going to beat us no problem, and I think that helped us. We believed we could win, and it, and it was kind of this quiet confidence about us that, you know, we know we're a better hockey club than everyone's giving us credit for, but let's not let the cat out of the bag. That's fine with us, and, and I think that's what happened. I think uh, Toronto finally did respect us near the end, but I think uh, it was, you know, maybe too little too late, so to speak. And Brett Hedekin gave the Canes an early lead, but a late goal by Toronto turned the Caniacs in their seats into Cardiacs again as another overtime game was played out at the arena. In the overtime, the big Swede, Nick Valine, unleashed another OT missile, and another jubilant crowd went home elated as the Hurricanes headed to the Great White North, tied at one in the series. That was a lucky goal. He hit a, I think he hit Aki Berg's skate. Not much, but just, I mean, it's not, it's not much to, he just hit it, like, and I think it won five holes. I never saw that, but it was, 
That was pretty funny. After that, and I had to go to this big press conference. You know, you just want to see guys like that do well, and then when they succeed like that, it makes it all much more special. And, uh, you know, he was our secret weapon, and he came through a couple times for us, and, uh, you know, the guys were overjoyed to see him come through. Nick Valine had become Mr. Overtime, and the Canes headed to the Great White North tied at one. In Game 3, Jeff O'Neill would have a career-defining moment of his own. Taking a puck in the eye early in the game, O'Neill would battle through the injury all game long. Wouldn't you know that the game would go into overtime? And in that OT, Jeff O'Neill, a Toronto boy, would become known as the Eye of the Hurricane. You know, that's just a, another, you know, I think defining uh, moment of our hockey club. I mean, uh, we talked about our character all season long and, and our, our ability to, to sort of battle through things. And, and here's a guy whose eye was, if it wasn't for the ice bags on the bench in between shifts, would have been shut. And, uh, you know, he wasn't going to jump ship on the guys he's going to hang in there and battle with it. This is nice with the step on Erickson. Francis is in. Trying to make the pass. Got it. Shot scored. It's all over. Had it left there. Jeff O'Neill in overtime. And Carolina wins 2-1. to one. They lead the series 2-1. to one. That game in Toronto where he got hurt and he continued to play uh, when he didn't have to and not only continued to play but fought through guys checking him and fought through everything necessary to be successful and uh, he scored that winning goal it's a goal not many players can score uh, it was a great goal but to his credit um, he, he just he just proved that he's a star player in this league and a great player he, he's still mad at me because after he scored the goal I went to give him a hug and I guess I punched him in the eye <laughs> it only looked better for the paper the next day I, I have respect for him the way he came back and, and played um, you know the, the rest of the game and you know obviously scoring the goal I also have respect for you know him having to walk around looking like that for a couple days because that was uh, that wasn't pretty. Game four was a Latvian legend game, and the Air Canada Center would become King Arthur's Court as he turned away 31 Maple Leaf shots to record his first playoff shutout. The playoffs are the time when, when the fo focus doesn't falter much, you know, it doesn't fade away because every shot is is big shot. And the three nothing game in Toronto that puts us up three one was the most dominant performance I had seen by him in the entire playoffs and, and rivaled what Theodore had done to us and, and to Boston in the first two rounds. He was incredible. You know, to have two goalies play so well like that, uh, it's a shame that that one team has to lose, but uh, <laughs> thank God it was them. And, uh, you know, Archer stood tall and, uh, you know, he played great. And shutout and the Carolina Hurricanes are one win away <laughs> from the Stanley Cup Finals. And the, the last one's the hardest one to win. The Hurricanes were one win away from the Stanley Cup Final when they returned from Toronto and the rabid Kaniacs of the ESA could taste the Stanley Cup Finals as they took the ice for Game 5. But alas, the Maple Leafs refused to go quietly into the night and the Hurricanes were headed back to T.O. for Game 6. No, we were disappointed to lose, and, and you don't want to, you'd love to win in front of your home crowd. If there's an advantage to it, sometimes, I mean, if we had won here, it would have been so wild that, that you wonder if your players think that's the end of your season. You know, you've had your party, it's over. But uh, winning uh, on the road in the playoffs, I think, in a, in a lot of ways, is even more special because you get to keep your team together. You get to keep them in the locker room together for a while. They get on a plane, they hang out together. They really get to bond and enjoy that experience. Game six was a classic battle of goalkeepers with both men refusing to give an inch. But in the third period, something had to give. Everly gives the puck away to O'Neill. He's going to the net, a shot stopped by Joseph, they score! Thomas Caberlet with the gap, and the Carolina Hurricanes have scored to make it one to nothing. Leading 1-0 with under one minute to go, the Leafs crashed the net and finally got one through Arthur Zerbe, and we journey once again into the familiar ice of overtime. You know, as a playoffs go, you got to kind of learn to regroup no matter what happens. There's some things that happen out there you just cannot believe, but you got to just put it behind you and, and get focused for the overtime. See, everybody knows that it's nip and tuck here. I mean, 
that, that you're the turn of the puck away from success or failure. And, uh, that's tough to take, but this team continue. And, and again, the same thing happened. I think we got out of the gate a little slow in that next period, and our team made some huge saves. And then, uh, and then we scored Jelly, perfect, perfectly fitting that Marty Jelena would score that goal. Score! Martin Jelena in sudden death overtime! The Carolina Hurricanes are going to the Stanley Cup Finals! Martin Jelena had sent his team and their Caniacs into the pandemonium of the Stanley Cup Finals. A first for both franchise and community, and the Carolinas were seeing red. The Hurricanes arrived at the airport to what they had become used to seeing throughout the playoffs. Throngs of Caniacs lined the fences and parking lots at RDU to welcome home their team that had become part of their hearts and minds. The team known as the Eastern Conference Champions. Uh, it was great to see them out there, I'll tell you what, after the first time we came home, uh, I was sitting in the, the window seat looking out and I said, boys, they're here, you know, the Caniacs are here. And, after that, every time we flew in, you know, someone would say, are they there, are they there, are they there? And they'd look out and get a count and give them an estimate, and the guys on the other side of the plane would say, no way, no way, they're not here. And then, at, you know, the build-up, you know, all the way to the conference finals, we get home at, you know, 1.30 in the morning or 2 in the morning, whatever it is, and we got the fire trucks out there giving us a salute, and uh, you know, I don't know how many thousand people were there, but it was, it was amazing. Yeah. For people to be out there, you know, until... 2, 2.30 in the morning, you know, you know, whatever time we got in that night, it was just unbelievable. <laughs> that was something uh, I haven't seen before. I don't see too many other places doing that for their, uh, for their team, so uh, I, uh, I definitely thank for that. And I, I kind of got goosebumps and uh, I, I was ready to go and uh, that's when you know why you're playing this game. Really proud of our players and, and the coaches, they did a great job. I played with a lot of discipline, a lot of character, and that's why we got this far. And obviously, I'd like to thank our fans that you can see in the background. They've been great to us. It feels great. There's no question about it. I think it was a great, great team effort. And, uh, and to see the fans going crazy like this, and, and to get a big win, to get to the finals, and who knows what can happen now. I mean, it's, it's just a great feeling. It's, it's nice to be part of it. After only five years, the Stanley Cup Finals had arrived here in the Triangle. And fans started lining up at 11 p.m. the previous night in hopes of getting seats to the greatest show on ice. In 35 minutes, not a single seat remained in the ESA as the anticipation for Game 1 grew. It's great to be part of something really special here and the tradition and everything. Uh, I just think this is a great town for the sport. You have four or five different major Division I universities that people pull for, and, and I think most of those were represented in line out here, and they're all kind of focused their energies in the same direction, and I think it's something really unique, you know, that hockey's got going for it here, and uh, in the team, I think this, this community really likes, because they're a bunch of class guys, there's not those uh, pro sports, egos, things like that, they're hard workers, and they're class people, and I think that's another reason that community's really embraced them. Oh, this is awesome. When I grew up watching the Bruins, we could never get tickets, so I'm praying that I actually get to go after all those years of not being able to get to go. The champions from the West, the Detroit Red Wings, a team chock full of NHL All-Stars and future Hall of Famers, led by a current Hall of Famer and head coach Scotty Bowman. The $64 million roster was a who's who of hockey legends. Steve Iserman, Brett Hull, Sergei Fedorov, Luke Robitaille, Dominic Hoshik, Chris Chelios. The challenge was immense as the Canes went into game one. Hill again, shot, score! What a blast by Sean Hill! Long up ice, onside, O'Neill in, shot! Hoshik, score! Stunned everybody with the first win and the best of seven. These Hurricanes are proving to be something else. It was just kind of a scramble, and, and, the, and I saw the pass was going to be coming out in front of the net, and I tried to position myself, and uh, I knew Hasek would be going down, and I was hoping I could get enough on it to get up and over him. And 
you know, fortunately I was able to do that and, and get us that win. And, the underdogs from the South had taken game one from the mighty Red Wings, and the world finally took note that this team was for real. The Canes also moved into second place all-time in overtime victories during a single playoff with their seventh OT win. Detroit took game two on a power play goal by Nick Lidstrom. Game three was an NHL classic, as both teams battled into the wee hours of the morning in the third longest game in Stanley Cup Finals history. You know, I think both teams understood the winner of game three had a real good chance of, of winning that series. The Canes drew first blood on a great play by Josef Wasacek. After Igor Larionov tied it, 92 came through again as Jeff O'Neill put the Canes ahead. With just over one minute left, six skaters on the ice. Brett Hull gets the tying goal. In overtime, Urbe was amazing, stopping everything Detroit could muster. In the early morning hours, the oldest man on the ice ended the third longest game in Stanley Cup Finals history. The Detroit Red Wings, three, the Hurricanes, two. Wow. I thought leading up until that, to the five minute mark of the third period, that was as good a game as we had played against Detroit, and even better than the first game that we had, uh, we had lost, but that was, a, that was a tough loss for a team who was, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say that we, we thought it was over by losing that game by any means, because we certainly never played like that. But when you look back and say where were the turning points in the series, that was obviously one of them. I really think that uh, game three, the long overtime, which was one of the greatest games in NHL uh, history, um, if we'd have won that game, I think we'd have won the series. I think if we could have you know, certainly hung on in game three and won that one, um, then we possibly could have had a different outcome. But uh, you know, ifs and buts for sugar and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. In the next game, Detroit flexed their muscles and iced Game 4. Facing elimination in Game 5, the Hurricanes never quit. And it took every ounce of effort and every dollar spent for the Red Wings to finally defeat the Hurricanes and hoist the Stanley Cup. Austin Fedorov's got it. Sergei Fedorov in. Shot. Irvay denies. Chelios in the corner. Lariano. Lariano center. Holds some shot. The flip and scores. Steve Eisenman going for his patented high to the short side. Step out and move it. Shanahan scores! Brandon Shanahan! Ashik lost it behind the net. Got a shoot, they do. O'Neal. Headline is good! And on the goal! What a bad oh, hit. Oh, they're going to review that. That came, that went in and came out. Six years, it can be said, the Detroit Red Wings are Stanley Cup champions. To, to go to the finals and lose, it's always uh, heartbreaking. But then again, how many how many teams, how many players get the chance to play even in finals? It was it was unbelievable. Um, I mean, everything uh, every, it was everything it's cracked up to be and more. I mean, uh, we, uh, we we may not have walked away with the hardware, but uh, it was uh, it was quite an experience, and uh, I'll never forget it. The whole run was so exciting for us, and to see the way the fans reacted to it. I had to tell you, it was just great fun. It was you sitting in the front seat of the plane, and everybody is waiting to land to see how many lunatics are going to be at the airport tonight at 2 in the morning. Well, the challenge for us now uh, is a little bit different. Last year, our challenge was, was believing in ourselves and, and that we were that good and we could accomplish that. Um, you know, that's no longer a secret. You know, we understand we're a good hockey club, but everybody else understands that too now. So every night's going to be a lot tougher. And now the challenge comes for us more so in the mental aspect, getting ourselves ready to play and playing at the level we, we need to play at each and every night. We had a chance to win the series and we didn't. But now what the Hurricanes have done is learned how to win. And all those teams that win the Stanley Cup, they have to get there, they have to get a feel for it, and ultimately uh, you get back there and win it. Though they came up short, the mark of this incredible story cannot be summed up simply by victory or defeat. The story is really threefold. For the players, respect. The respect they gained by conquering and challenging some of the NHL's best. For the triangle, enhanced credibility. Hundreds of national and international media descended upon the ESA, and they found it to be the perfect venue for the Stanley Cup playoffs. And finally, the bond between the Canes and their Caniacs, a relationship that will hold true for many years to come. This was truly evident at the end of the year, one of the greatest sports celebrations in Carolina history, when thousands of Caniacs descended upon downtown Raleigh to honor the Carolina Hurricanes and celebrate the Eastern Conference Championship.
thank you very much to the City of Raleigh and the Triangle for all the support in this great evening. And people now around the, this country have now finally recognized you fans because for a long time didn't get the respect that you all deserve but people talk about having the loudest fans in the league but not only do we have the loudest fans in the league you're the most loyal the most respectful and the greatest fans of the national hockey league The question was asked, how are these guys getting there? How are they doing it? The secret was the fans. This is not a building that we went into, that we were intimidated. Nobody was as loud. Nobody was as loud for 60 minutes. Nobody was as loud in the overtime. people here there's basically four major sports and uh, I think one thing ra that rally has to be proud of is that we have the best fans of all major sports you people are the greatest and we love you guys and we really appreciate what you did for us this year so we're going to do this again next year we're going to bring home that big jug for you people all right we love you I uh I get the pleasure of speaking on behalf of the players and their families and uh I want to thank you all for the support that you've given us. I know it felt great for us to drive around town and see all the hurricane flags in the cars. And the numerous cocaine signs in all the different business establishments. and Some people painted their cars. It was just tremendous. I also want to thank them. The guys certainly appreciate all those Caniacs who met our airplane numerous times at two in the morning. And, and we hope you certainly enjoyed the opportunity to tailgate at the SA until the middle of June. There's, there's only one problem I have. The next time we all get together like this, we're going to make sure we bring Stanley with us. The Hurricanes and their fans raised the bar both on the ice and in the stands. This was truly a season no one will ever forget. But new chapters will be written as both team and community will raise Kane once again. Thank you very much to the fans. So uh, You got the, the credit uh, that's long overdue to you. I'd like to personally go out and shake each and every one of your hands and thank you for the support that you gave our team. And it was instrumental in our success when we won, uh, whether you were in the stands or back home cheering us from afar. Uh, you were right there with the players and the staff and uh, it was a great run by all of us together. But from, from the coaching staff and from the players and everybody in our organization, uh, I'd like to thank every one of you for your support. It was critical, and uh, it's, it must be nice to be known as the best fans in the National Hockey League. I want to thank the uh, fans of the Carolina Hurricanes for their tremendous support last season, not only uh, during the playoffs, but all season long. Uh, their enthusiasm and, and excitement certainly helped us uh, create what I think was a very exciting playoff run, and uh, you know, hopefully their passion and, and uh, our commitment to being successful again this year will bring on another great year I like the one last year. I'd personally like to thank all you Caniacs out there for your support during last year's playoff run. Uh, we've officially become the best fans in hockey. Thanks very much. I just want to thank you guys. It was uh, great to play in front of you guys, and uh, hopefully it's going to be the same like last year in the playoffs. I just want to say thank you to all you Caniac fans. You guys are the top fans in the league, but uh, I want to make sure you don't rest on your laurels. We need you again this year, so uh, we're looking forward to seeing the opening night, October 9th. Thank you. Just like to thank all the Hurricane fans out there. You guys tremendous uh, supported us this year, and uh, you know we're gonna try to do it again this year. Thank you, fans. Uh, thanks so much for everything uh, this past season. Uh, you guys are outstanding, and uh, I hope you guys can keep it up. I just want to say thanks to uh, all the Hurricanes fans out there for uh, all the support you guys gave us this year. You guys were great. Thanks. Just like to say to you, fans, uh, I want to thank you so much uh, just for your support throughout the 
the uh, regular season, throughout the playoffs. Uh, obviously, uh, meeting us late at the airport and, and uh, being there at 2-3 o'clock in the morning to, to greet us, it was an uh, absolute honor for us as players to be able to, to see that and having uh, really the best fans in the world. Thanks a lot. Thank you for everybody uh, about last year. Uh, it was a good ride. Hopefully, yeah, we can repeat it and uh, go all the way and win the whole thing. Thank you. Big thank you and appre in appreciation of uh, what our fans did uh, uh, for us during the playoffs and even uh, during the stretch run at the end of the uh, season because uh, uh, not too many people in the uh, league still realize and nobody imagined what the crowd here could do and being uh, part of the loudest building and you know, biggest cheering fans and uh, just just tremendous atmosphere, uh, especially in a place where were a lot of doubters and thought that hockey is going to die sooner or later. Eventually, there is going to be no hockey. Uh, we together with uh, with the fans proved that hockey is here to stay, and and uh, that's the big big reason why we could. Uh, pull it off because we had the support. Without the support uh, with half empty st seats, I'm sure this team wouldn't have been able to advance as far as they went in, in last year's playoffs. So thank you very much.